most important point I want to make, and then I'll be back at 4 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Eastern, for a continuation here at the, for, uh, at the War Room, uh, is the news we broke about uh, General McMaster bad-mouthing his boss, calling the president a dope, saying that he can't understand any of the global issues, that he can't think beyond 140 characters, and that he should not have his hands on the nuclear codes. He said this to Safra Katz, the uh, chief executive officer of Oracle. Uh, she told Sheldon Adelson, or the billionaire Nevada businessman, I demand the mainstream media ask Katz, ask Adelson, see if either one of them will issue a formal denial. That's the, my, my point here. We have broken news here at InfoWars, news that would have been published in the New York Post weeks ago, but for the fact that Jared Kushner called Rupert Murdoch and had this story spiked. But you can't spike stories at InfoWars.com because we are committed to the truth. Oh, and I'll be back shortly with some more blockbuster news on what's going on in the Game of Thrones around Donald Trump. That's right. We are in the Game of Thrones right now for America. Thank you, Roger. We will speak with you in just 52 minutes from now. So there you go, folks. Roger Stone with the breaking news. Now joined by Roger Stone. We're going to talk about this. Steve Bannon is in the headlines, Roger. And it's really because they're afraid of how effective he can now be outside of the controlled White House administration. Well, first of all, I want to commend uh, Alex Jones for that genuine fruit of the loom white T-shirt. Nothing says angry white guy like a white tee. Uh, let me say that um, I like Steve Bannon. You know, I like his feisty style. Our politics are very similar. I, too, am a nationalist. I believe in American exceptionalism, American sovereignty, American uh, uh, prestige in the world. But I don't want to go out chasing every foreign war. And like me, Steve understands the problems of open borders in our current immigration system. There are men of action and men of words. And on the words, I'm with uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, I have uh, was critical about the fact, uh, first of all, that I always defended him against the charge of anti-Semitism. It's a bum rap. Bannon is no racist and no anti-Semite. It's, it's a false narrative. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I thought it was a mistake when he brought no other Trump people into the administration or the White House. Uh, personnel is policy. We learned this in the Reagan years. Uh, and now we have a government of establishment country club Republicans and Obama holdovers thwarting the Trump agenda uh, and thwarting the will of the American people in the last election. Uh, and Steve, unfortunately, found when he was surrounded by the globalists, uh, the international neocon crowd anxious to get him out of the president's ear, he had no allies because he had recruited none. I think that was a failing. Uh, Steve uh, reminds me of an enthusiast. Uh, he comes from the world of Wall Street and money making uh, as a, uh, a a film promoter, a film producer, uh, but he has no real practical political experience at electing people. He did, however, uh, uh, announce a PAC effort, which I completely support, uh, that I assume, uh, based on today's announcement, the Mercers will finance wealthy uh, reclusive family from Long Island, heavy investors at Breitbart and in Cambridge Analytics um, that I imagine fits in here somewhere. Uh, but And they have targeted a bunch of Republican senators. I applaud this. It's a too bad that they uh, didn't pop up in time to uh, take on Luther Strange in Alabama. Steve was in the White House when the president endorsed Strange. So uh, I'm glad to have him, you know, a little late, but I'm glad he's out there attacking the right people. I concur with him entirely in his criticism, Owen, of, of Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. They have tried to play the president. Uh, Ryan has his own presidential ambitions. 
Uh, McConnell is more interested in the status quo. But we're learning more and more about the connections between he and his wife and substantial Chinese industrial interests, who are, of course, aligned with that communist government. Uh, so uh, they are an obstacle. Uh, and Bannon is right. When it comes to his assertion about firing Comey, was the greatest mistake of all time. Steve is absolutely wrong. Yeah, that's the, that was the one thing the, where I completely it the, disagreed. It's not the decision to fire Comey. It is the timing. Comey should have been fired the moment Donald J. Trump took his hand off the Bible. Steve was around him at that time, but he obviously didn't advise the president as to the treacherousness of Comey, who, as we dig deeper and deeper, has been a, essentially a fix-it man for the Bushes and the Clintons, but who, like J. Edgar Hoover, started to think he was bigger than the presidency of the United States, referred to the FBI as my agency, said Trump will have to put up with me for many years, or they will have to put up with me for many years. Look, his arrogance grew. He, he ran a cover-up for Hillary. That's obstruction of justice. He lied to the Congress under oath about their um, illegal wiretapping of 30,000 Americans that was exercised, or I should say, um, uh, executed by Obama's NSA. Clapper, Rice, Brennan, uh, uh, Rogers, perhaps even Valerie Jarrett, these people should be indicted based on what we know. And Comey lied about it in his testimony before the House, so he's subject to a perjury charge. Bannon is and entirely wrong about this. Comey didn't go soon enough. Uh, we might not have Robert Mueller today uh, under different circumstances. And then we hear that Lois Lerner gets to walk, and I completely concur with what you're saying. And, and I want to mention something else, Roger. You go on the Alex Jones show today. You break huge news talking about Trump's main bodyguard, main confidant being ousted from the White House at the essentially request of the generals. He steps aside, takes the gentleman's move, and then everyone wants to pick up what broke on the Jones show today, but nobody wants to talk about what you're talking about. Everyone's attacking Alex, saying, look at Alex Jones, saying they're going to drug the president. Look at Alex Jones, saying they're coming after the president. Look at Alex Jones, saying they're going to remove the president. Nobody talks about the news that you broke. It's all about trying to attack Alex Jones as somebody crazy instead of the real news that we break here every day. Well, but it's actually, Owen, it's the same story. They're just telling it from the other end. Uh, Keith Schiller, uh, let's not mince words. He was purged. Keith Schiller, the Trump loyalist, the patriot, the decorated New York Police Department cop, who for as long as I can remember in my long relationship and friendship with Donald Trump has been the man who has Trump's back. He is the guy who is the last person who sees the president at night and the first guy who sees him in the morning. Keith Schiller is the guy who keeps one eye on the crowd and the other eye on the other bodyguards and anybody who's present with a gun because he's smart. Uh, and no one can possibly question his loyalty to the president. Keith Schiller has never done anything that he wasn't instructed to do by the president. And his independent access to the president was a threat. General so, Kelly uh, essentially uh, tried to tell Schiller that if he wanted to see the president uh, from his new position as director of operations, which is essentially a job that was created for him so that he could be there for the president. He is usually the guy in the photo. Now, suddenly they want him gone. This is ominous, in my opinion. Well, it, it really, to me, shows how spot on you are when bringing this to the attention of our audience when they want to break news about Alex today saying they're trying to drug the president. It makes media matters. It makes the Washington Examiner. The list goes on. But none of them will cover Keith Schiller. None of well, them will cover Roger they, Stone. They need to connect the two. And the real point here is that the possibility of a poisoning or drugging of the president becomes far more likely if his chief bodyguard is removed. Now, uh, General Kelly and the Secret Service have total control of the package, as the service calls it when you work in the White House. 
Uh, and I know the extents to which the globalists are capable of going. Uh, several credible sources, including a reporter at the New York Times, uh, have spoken independently to the president by phone and have said that he seemed at some point in the conversation disoriented a bit and slurring his words. Donald Trump, who I've known for 40 years, does not drink, won't even take an aspirin, doesn't do drugs, uh, and uh, he has not only the sharpness of attack, but extraordinary energy. This is not the Trump that I know. It's a legitimate story. This is a legitimate story, folks. They're going to try to pick it up and spin it, but we know the news. They remove Schiller, Trump's main bodyguard, as Roger said, first in the morning, last at night. If he's not there, what can they do to the president? We'll be right back with more. All right, folks, welcome back to the War Room. War, at War Room Show on Twitter, warroom.show, the direct URL, War Room Show YouTube channel. We're joined with Roger Stone now of Cold Stone Truth. Dot com. And again, the story is they removed Trump's main bodyguard, his main confidant, to completely have him alone, completely have him isolated. So maybe they can slip something in his drink, slip something while he's sleeping. His main bodyguard, who was the one watching the watchers, has now been ousted, purged by the generals. Now, one of those generals is H.R. McMaster's. And the breaking news on that is that he's bad mouthing the president. While he is out, uh, perhaps in fear of his own reputation, what do you think, Roger? Well, uh, as I reported today, uh, I'm with Alex Jones. McMaster uh, went to dinner with uh, a uh, CEO executive uh, from Oracle, Safra Katz. Katz is uh, widely admired in the business community and was being recruited as a possible chairman for the president's um, uh intelligence review board. McMaster became exceedingly inebriated, according to the report I have received, uh, and during the dinner took a phone call from the president, at least having the good sense to step away from the table. But when he returned, he went into a diatribe about his boss. He described the president as a dope said that he couldn't think beyond 140 characters, that he couldn't understand any complex issues, uh, and that uh, the idea of Trump with his uh, hands on the nuclear football was inappropriate or scary. He said it just, it's scary. And that his view is uh, his job was to save Trump from blowing up the world. Now, um, this uh, offended, uh, as you might expect, uh, Katz, who is known to be a supporter of the president, uh, and she declined to work with such a man. Uh, and she did, however, tell this to uh, Sheldon Adelson, the billionaire uh, Jewish Republican philanthropist and gaming king, who uh, is a owner of the Las Vegas Journal Review. Uh, needless to say, Adelson was also offended but um, as I reported here on Infowars, Katz declines to speak to anybody in the press, but has said she will speak to the president about it if she is asked to do so. Uh, and let's hope that that happens and happens soon. Uh, oh, and as you know, now McMaster uh, moves into the void created by the firing of General Flynn. When history comes back and looks at the Trump administration and this internal struggle, a struggle that I hope the nationalists will win, they will realize that a, that a seminal moment was the unfair and unwarranted firing of General Flynn. It was from that moment on, with the assistance of the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, that the neocons and those who had opposed Trump, those indeed in bed with the deep state intelligence agencies, who have leaked against the president in violation of the law since the inception of the, his presidency would take key positions around the president. Gary Cohn, Democrat, liberal, advocate for a carbon tax, chairman of Goldman Sachs, attacked by Donald Trump for their illegal loan to Ted Cruz, attacked by Donald Trump 
for giving Hillary 675,000. Why would Mr. Cohn be in a Trump White House or Sheila Habib Powell, uh, mm. who comes uh, to the public eye as an aide to uh, the former senator from Texas, uh, who is uh, a mindless neocon uh, and promotes her to be ambassador to NATO. Uh, so uh, it is uh, it then goes on to service uh, in the Bush White House, Council on Foreign Relations, Harvard, internationalist evil, evil, according some, to my sources. Yeah, and some believe that uh, Dina Powell may have actually been one of the leakers that was leaking stuff to the media out of Trump's White House. And we've got, a, I mean, this is just a short list, but Flynn, Bannon, Schiller, all people that were in there to stick up for President Trump. They've all, they're all patriots. They all put America first. They've all been ousted. But back to McMaster, Roger, what do you think is the main cause of McMaster's behavior? Do you think this is something motivated because he's afraid of public retribution or the public eye? Do you think he was perhaps just drunk and let his true emotions fly? Well, first of all, I think, you know, in vino veritas, that's his view. He, he thinks Trump is a dope and that he is there to save the world. Uh, he's an arrogant bureaucrat uh, who, whose career was saved by General Petraeus because essentially the guy is a screw up in his career. Uh, his, the fact that he worked for a think tank financed by George Soros, Israeli intelligence uh, has told me, and I reported it here at InfoWars, that McMaster is in email contact with Soros himself He's also an email contact with General Petraeus, and he is a say, and he has shared a significant, although it's not clear whether it's classified, information with both. Just the fact that Donald Trump's national security advisor is in communications with Soros would be a reason to discharge him, in my opinion. Wow. And this is big breaking news. Roger broke that story originally. Now comes on this show today on the Alex Jones Show, now in the war room, breaks the new now, news. Go ahead. One important question, because they just showed us uh, a great picture of Steve Bannon. Uh, is it that he cannot shave his entire face, or is it that he shouldn't shave his face at all? Uh, you know, I complimented you two days ago on the clean shaven look. I thought it looked great. You can get away with it at your age, I must say, because the stubble has a kind of Brando-esque quality to it when you're your age. But for Steve, it makes him look like a homeless person. Uh, and therefore, I just cannot understand why anyone who knows that they have a, an interview on a big network like 60 Minutes would not bother to shave. Uh, you know, it's actually... Also, uh it's interesting, Roger. We're going to have a video, actually. We can, we can play this while you're on the air with us, or we can do this later uh, when you've departed. But you can actually see CBS, or excuse me, um, oh, yeah, 60 Minutes is on CBS. They actually did a lighting trick. Now, this has nothing to do with whether his razor is working properly or not, but they did do a lighting trick on Bannon to make him look bad that they didn't do on Charlie Rose. We're going to have that video later. I'm sure you're familiar with these techniques. Well, first of all, let me say two things. One, does that mean they created the red circles under his eyes that look like he's Actually, yes. The, well, yeah, actually, did, surprisingly, and, well, we, we, we'll see in the video. Like, whoever that, because he looks like he was freebasing all night. So it was, it's not, uh, the program must work. But that, of course, would not change the question of his shaving. Uh, you know, also, I saw a picture the other day of Steve in the Oval Office wearing a, a dark button-down shirt open at the collar. Inappropriate. Ronald Reagan let's just take off his jacket in that office. Let's just be very clear. Roger Stone is trying to get the movement for medicinal marijuana, so he's not making fun of you if you like that. Here again. And, uh, uh, I want to say that this next segment is brought to you by Brain Force, uh, because without this extraordinary product, I would not have the energy to be here. I was up late last night reporting uh, the breaking news, checking with triple sources in some case to make sure that when you hear what's going on inside the Trump administration or in American politics, we stand by it. So Brain Force, uh, I have found, helps you focus mentally, gives you a, 
a lift in your mental energy and your clarity works very well for me. Uh, and when you go there to the site, you help finance uh, the expansion that Alex Jones has planned for InfoWars, of which The War Room with Owen Scheuer and I, and soon Mike Cernovich, another patriot and great friend, um, will help uh, uh, reach millions more Americans uh, to tell them what's really going on in the struggle between uh, good and uh, evil. Joining me now uh, is uh, a guy who um, I really think of as a radio legend. I first became acquainted with Steve Malzberg by listening to radio here in New York City and his coverage of the Reagan uh, uh, 1980 campaign and Reagan didn't see. Uh, and I have learned so much that I know about radio by listening to the great Steve Malzberg. So, Steve, welcome to InfoWars. It is my pleasure and my honor, and I wish all of you the best of luck uh, with your, your new show and your new format, and it's very exciting. So, uh, Steve, you're, uh, you're joining us from New York today, and uh, what was your assessment of the 9-11 uh, ceremonies and particularly the president's speech? I thought the president was was fine. I thought he was, you know, hit all the right notes, did everything he was supposed to do. Uh, and it was obviously very heartfelt. You could tell that. And um, I understand uh, Hillary missed it. <laughs> Hillary was busy blaming uh, uh, white people and Russians and uh, uh, men and the FBI and whoever else she could for her, her loss on some TV program somewhere. Uh, so she had no interest in uh, falling down again at another 9-11 ceremony. But it's a solemn day. And, and Roger, as you well know, um, there's a lawsuit that is ongoing where you have 1,400 families who lost loved ones on 9-11, and they are trying to get to the bottom of the role, or let's put it this way, they're trying to get full exposure of the role of the Saudi government in the 9-11 terror attack. Uh, it's an extraordinary and long story, as you know, Steve. The, the congressional uh, investigation into 9-11 had details about financing from big families close to the Saudi royalty. Uh, and several of the hijackers have uh, connections uh, there. Uh, the Congress... Uh, and the government have kept that kept that report for some time classified. Senator John McCain took a million dollars from the Saudis to the McCain Institute. He didn't seem to have any interest in the Congress releasing that report. It finally became public and it is confirmed. So the role of the Saudis uh, and the role of the Saudi connections to 9-11 uh, is you're absolutely right, not fully exposed for the American people. The first person to start asking questions about this was Donald Trump. So uh, you can see why uh, Obama uh, actually vetoed legislation passed by the Congress that would have made the Saudis financially liable. He is part of the cover-up. Will Donald Trump's administration continue that cover-up? That's why I found the president's trip to Saudi, while generally... Uh, good in the sense that we do have a joint interest in a nuclear Iran and kneecapping them, um, I would not have bowed to the Saudi king, as you know. Well, you know, there's a, here's the deal. And, and we're so concerned about, about North Korea, rightfully so, and what they could do to us and how we should uh, you know, possibly take preemptive action. But if we were attacked, in effect, by the Saudi government or attacked with the support and the financing and the planning and the knowledge of the Saudi government, then every American deserves to know that. And the Saudi government, notwithstanding all the geopolitical implications, need to be held accountable. There was a great story by Paul Sperry in the New York Post a couple of days ago, and he talks about a dry run that took place about a year, a little more than a year before 9-11. Two people, two people posing as students in this country who it turned out were working for the Saudi government had tickets purchased for them by the Saudi embassy in Washington. They flew from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. They asked all kinds of questions. It was a test run, a dry run. They tried to storm or get into the cockpit 
about four separate times. The pilot made an emergency landing in Ohio. They were handcuffed. They were taken off the plane. But the FBI never charged them, never pursued it. And subsequently, we found out that these two, as I said, had their tickets purchased by the Saudi embassy. They were sent there by the Saudi government and they were connected to terrorist training camps in Afghanistan with Al Qaeda. If we know all this, there's a lot more that we don't know and we need to know and we need to react accordingly. We cannot tolerate, Roger, the fact that the Saudi government knew and helped 9-11. Well, uh, Paul Sperry, in my view, really one of the finest investigative journalists working uh, in the country today. I acknowledge in my book, uh, The Clinton's War on Women, some of his extraordinarily accurate and precise reporting. And that I read that story and I thought it was uh, truly amazing. Uh, the uh, uh, Going back to today's ceremony, I thought the president um, was quite good, uh, eloquent, in fact, uh, and uh, I thought that um, he uh, it continues to confound his critics. Um, much was made of a story that is out there now because it's being bastardized and lampooned by the clowns at Media Matters for America, a, a little tiny group of um, Clinton psycho fans and rape apologists uh, who report to David Brock with substantial financing from the Nazi collaborator George Soros, uh, and they have, uh, you know, 100 bots churning out fake nonsense. But Alex Jones raises a valid point. Uh, with Trump's longtime bodyguard, uh, his right-hand man, the guy who's always had his back, patriot and Trump loyalist, Keith Schiller, a decorated and experienced New York uh, Police Department uh, uh, veteran, uh, and moving him out of the president's circle, cutting off his access, uh, the possibility and perhaps I would say likelihood of the president being drugged is entirely uh, uh, possible. We do know the president doesn't drink. He doesn't do drugs. Uh, he has an, a great, uh, a sharp as attack and he has a great energy level. So it is odd behavior and it's coming not from one but from multiple sources who do speak with him. So um, cause effect. The media needs to tell the whole story. Uh, there's no question Schiller is purged by Kelly in his insane drive to get full control. This guy makes Al Haig look like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. <laughs> I'm in charge. Well, listen, I, I, I can't comment on any of what you just said because I don't know enough what I do know enough about is Kelly and what he is trying to do and what he is succeeding in doing uh, to the inner circle, to the people who surround Donald Trump. And that's why I fear we will never get the truth. We will never get the truth. We will never get what we're looking for from prosecution of Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. We will never get so much of what we expected and what we wanted and what we need to have from Donald Trump because of the restrictions being placed around him. The people that are now... Welcome back. I'm Roger Stone here at uh, the War Room with Owen Scheuer. Uh, and um, uh, we're still on the line with uh, Steve Malsberg. Uh, Steve, uh, I want to thank you for coming on with our kind of uh, dry run, our soft launch, as it were. Uh, I have admired your work on radio. you admired your work at Newsmax. To me, you are one of the most incisive uh, political analysts out there. You call it as you see it, and you really understand the New York scene politically. So um, I, uh, I'm really delighted that you could join us here. Well, Roger, you know how I feel about you, and uh, you've been kind enough to join me many, many times over the many years. Uh, at any time, and I'm honored to be on with you. And if anybody wants to follow me, uh, it's all the same. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Steve M. Talk. And uh, good luck with the show. I hope to be back. Well, and Steve, give my regards to your son, who I know is uh, probably the country's number one Donald Trump supporter, and perhaps even a future president himself. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Great to have you. So uh, the uh, question that seems to be flooding in from reporters is kind of whether Steve Bannon. Uh, Bannon uh, demonstrates that he is an empresario at heart, 
dominating the media today between uh, a 60 Minutes a performance in which Owen Shoyer reported that they uh, manipulated the lighting to make him look particularly sinister. Now, we know this technique. It was used on Alex Jones in the vaunted uh, uh, Megyn Kelly uh, uh, interview, a dust-up from which I would argue Kelly came out second best. After all, her show is canceled, and InfoWars gained somewhere between five and six million new uh, viewers. And of course, when Alex Jones revealed how uh, the network had diced and spliced his interview to make it appear that he was answering one question with another, taking things out of context and so on. They also, as you would recall, uh, filmed the interview late at night in a rented house, cranked up the heat, lit him from under uh, beneath so that he would look satanic, hoping that he would sweat. And my guess is uh, hoping that he would show up after a few cocktails. On the contrary, uh, Jones was combative and his usual self, uh, and he created a record which ruined Ms. Kelly. So and this is very evocative, what they did to Alex, I think they did to Steve in this particular. But the question, of course, is uh, what does the president think of Steve? Uh, Steve, uh, I think, made a strategic error uh, by uh, essentially promoting the book Devil's Bargain that was written by a fellow named Josh Green, at least ostensibly, because the book reads like it was written by Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is, according to this book, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, and he was Trump's master strategist. Now, in all truth, uh, Donald Trump is his own chief strategist. From a timeline point of view, it would be fair to say that all of the key issues that elected Donald Trump were decided a year and a half to two years previously. To the extent that anyone helped President Trump shape these uh, themes, Sam Nunberg, the talented issues and press man who worked early for the campaign, may have had some impact, but only in helping the president formulate his thoughts. Trade, immigration and the wall, uh, improving our veterans' health care, making our NATO allies pay their fair share, and not running off to every foreign war at great expense uh, when our inherent national interest is not clear, were all themes selected not by Mr. Bannon in the final weeks of the campaign, but many, many months before that by Donald J. Trump himself. I left the Trump campaign, not out of disloyalty to the Donald, but because I realized he would be his own strategy. He knew his own mind on the issues and that I could be more effective to try to promote his election from the outside. Now, I like Bannon. I like his feisty style. I like the fact that he's a street fighter. And on the big issues, I suspect that we agree more than we disagree. Uh, and Steve is most definitely not a white supremacist. Or a, uh, or a racist, or a bigot, or an anti-Semite. These are entirely false accusations that I have written and spoken uh, uh, to knock them down. Uh, so let's be clear, however, that when I saw Steve in the Oval Office with an open-collar black shirt, I thought it offended the rules of good taste. Uh, but uh, as I said in the other segment, uh, he never used his enormous political capital uh, and his access, yes, his leverage, to recruit other men and women from the Trump revolution. There were highly capable men and women, people like uh, uh, David Urban and Ed Martin, uh, Annie Delgado, Susan Wiles, Definitely talented people with vast experience who could have been recruited for this administration, but whose White, but White House personnel under Wright's Priebus, another mistake, uh, couldn't get the time of day. Where was Mr. Bannon? Why was he not giving his Trumpian allies a hand up? 
when he found himself surrounded by the globalists, when Gary Cohn and Dina Powell, in concert with Jenry General Kelly, they went for a bit. He had no supporters, having recruited none. A fatal mistake by a rank amateur. I wish him well with his PAC effort. Uh, the Mercers, if they spend their money, uh, they did not, of course, spend on Ted Cruz's effort what they told us they were going to spend. And whether their um, mega targeting weapon Cambridge Analytics is worth anything at all, um, and how much of the PAC money goes to Cambridge Analytics, that'll all be interesting. But I agree with their U.S. Senate target list. Um, and, uh, uh, Owen, did you get a look at that list? No, but I think that they obviously are trying to check it off one by one to try to remove, you know, anyone Trump has from within. No, no, I'm referring to the target list that Bannon released today of U.S. senators who are opposed to the president that the oh, Bannon no, I, 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 will target. Let's pull that up. I know, for example, that Senate Robert Corker is on this list. Now, Corker, I am told, is under FBI investigation uh, because of allegations that he used information that he learned inside uh, as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is classified, and that he then was able to utilize that information, making foreign investments in certain key hedge funds and so on, amassing an enormous amount of money. All of that, of course, would be illegal. Now, uh, again, I stress that there's no finding against him, that that is the focal point of the investigation. It was enough, I can tell you, to knock Senator Corker off of the shortlist for vice president.